I'm here in the village of Sandback near Congleton in Cheshire and I'm here to look at one of the prime examples of an Anglo-Saxon, two examples of Anglo-Saxon high crosses. These are the Sandback crosses and they have a very interesting history, not only in terms of the mysterious origins of them, but also what happened to them during their later history. Some people believe they go right back as far as the 600s and were erected by King Pende, who was the son of King Penda, the last pagan Anglo-Saxon king of Mercia. Although there is a lot of conflicting theories about that, some believe they were erected as late as the 800 AD. They were splendid in many different carvings that seem to suggest both pagan and Christian motifs. This may have led to them being destroyed by Puritan stone killers in the 1600s who considered them idolatry. The cross themselves were smashed to pieces and scattered and used in building materials all over the village here. Eventually they were collected in the early 1800s and reassembled into the two crosses that you have behind me. However, regardless of the actual antiquity of the sandback crosses, they nevertheless pry open a portal into mysterious time frame of European history in which Christianity was unable to fully saturate itself within the daily life of Europeans and in particular the Germanic peoples. We are told by both theologians and mainstream historians that aside from one or two unfortunate events, the rollover from paganism towards Christianity was both relative and brief, and for the most part, a painless era. Once again, we are told this as if the process was somehow itself organic, as the pagans had just lost affection for their old gods, and were eager and willing to embrace this new god from the Middle East. This happening despite the enormous cultural, social, and even environmental differences between the Jewish-based religion of Christianity and the native pagan gods and cultural animism of Northern and Western Europe in particular. Reading between the lines of this era of European history, it is now my contention that much of this history is fabricated and in some cases outright lies and that in order for the religion of Christianity from the East to so successfully and all-encompassingly conquer the European tribes that both violence and elements of mind control would have been required in order to achieve this. And central to this massive theological psyop was the reconfiguration of the Nordic god Wotan, or Odin as he is known to the Vikings being dovetailed into the story of a Jewish rabbi whose breakaway sect became the social, cultural and theological software of the Roman Empire in its post-imperial form. Does this explain why the Puritans destroyed the sandback crosses and many similar objects like them almost a thousand years after the so-called successful conquest of Europe by the Christian Church? Is this the real reason that so much of the history of the Middle Ages is missing and simply lost, and what does remain is merely within a handful of texts contained within the Vatican archives to the point whereby it is near impossible to validate that the history of the Middle Ages even happened in the first place. This film is the story of how the Vatican stole the Votan Odin mythology and rebranded it as the story of Jesus Christ in order to convert, at least at a psychological level, the Nordic peoples of Europe. Like a dark family secret that is made known only to the curious and the initiated by not what is presented, but rather by what is clearly missing from the story. The purpose of this film is not to 
prove or disprove that the figure of Jesus Christ was a real person or not. Regardless of the existence or myth, this film is about how his followers of that of an obscure and fanatical Jewish sect became in time to be the most important and popular religion on earth. This remarkable story occurred as a direct result of proto-Christianity merging itself into a myriad of pagan gods and archetypes in order to spread itself throughout Europe and beyond. That the story of Christianity is more about how a second temple rabbinical sect from Roman occupied Judea 2000 years ago had to constantly assimilate itself into pre-existing pagan gods, feast days, holy places and specific methods of veneration in order to survive and thrive. From Mithra to Odin, from Hecate to the Lucifer of the pagan world and many many more examples. The most important of these appropriated gods being the literal reinvention of the story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This central tenant of Christendom, I believe, could well be a homage to the story of the Germanic and Norse god Odin or Wotan, as he is called in the Germanic cultures. Hanging from the Yggdrasil world tree rather than upon a crucifix on the Mount of Calvary just outside Jerusalem. And how Christians all over the world today, when they venerate the imagery of Jesus Christ on the cross, are in actuality worshipping the pagan Allfather of the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic tribes and the Norse Vikings which has been dovetailed into the story of a Hebrew carpenter from Nazareth in order to keep Christianity from vanishing into theological obscurity within Northern and Western Europe. Something of a spiritual alloy was created by the Vatican, which was to hammer home the domination of the Holy See and primarily into the pagan classical world. It was merely an offshoot of a Jewish radical sect with a reputation for violence and intolerance. Pagan temples and seats of learning such as the Temple of Palmyra in Syria, as well as the Library of Alexandria were destroyed by these Christian fanatics who originally came out of the desert practicing a new version of Abrahamic monotheism. Christian mobs were greatly feared for their zealotry and viciousness and were also universally considered to be fanatical and extremely dangerous. Not only to pagans of the Eastern Mediterranean, but also to traditional Jewish sects. Although Christians would later claim to have been victims of persecutions during these years, much of this was a result of acts of terrorism initially committed by Christians, which led in one instant to the Emperor Nero in 64 AD having hundreds of Christians burned alive in Rome for starting deliberate arson attacks in the city. During this period and for the next 500 years, the symbol of Jesus Christ was that of a stylized fish. There was no direct and specific imagery of Jesus Christ being crucified upon the cross. Although the story of Christ did end with his crucifixion and resurrection, the actual image of the crucifixion itself played a minor role within Christian theology and the everyday spiritual life of Christians. Christianity was still firmly Jewish all during this period and added to this an image of Christ nailed to the cross would have been seen as idolatry in accordance with rabbinical law. To further drive home this prohibition on graven images, as described within the Torah, Christians, once they attained control of the Roman Empire, set about destroying and disfiguring the artwork of the Roman and Greek pagan classical period. Iconoclastic fever took root. This attack upon the art science and literature of the classical pagan world 
eventually led to the destruction of 70% of the pagan classical world's artwork and nearly all of its literature and science. What remains today is derived from a small body of work smuggled into the Persian Empire, or else found in marble sculptures which had been buried on purpose for protection, or which have been fished out of rivers and the sea after the Christians threw them off bridges and docks. Christians citing Moses and the Golden Calf story within Exodus as their justification for destroying these ancient artworks. There was also a belief that these pagan statues of gods, goddesses and emperors were also containing demons and that these demons were a direct threat themselves to the tenacity of the Christian message. In fact, in some ways it could be seen that they did contain demons demons of ancient gods and goddesses of pagan systems that were incompatible with the new religion from the Middle East and therefore had to be exercised quite literally by casting them into the river Tiber as a kind of baptism of the unclean. Although we are told and it is very well known that the early fish symbol of the Christians was their secret code to avoid persecution. The fact that the symbol was so widespread and enjoyed such longevity suggests that it was a very public symbol of Christianity and not in any way a secret code at all. The Greek word for fish is ichthos, being an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, and so on. The Jesus Christ first edition story, if we can call it this, was solidified by St. Ignatius of Antioch in Syria about 110 AD. St. Ignatius oversaw and described the transmission of the Christian faith by means of an oral tradition known as apostolic succession. By the time the Emperor Constantine the Great had issued the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, which mandated complete toleration of Christianity within the Roman Empire, Christians themselves had long been moving within and recruiting among the upper classes of Roman society, postulizing wealthy Romans who had fallen under the spell of the previous Lismanibus debt cult. This situation developed over the next century as Romans of high status within politics, commerce, and the military embraced the Jewish cult from the Middle East in much the same way Hollywood celebrities today flock to Scientology. Away from the fashionable and slave-tended gardens of the Roman upper classes, among the ordinary Roman rank-and-filed military, Christianity had transformed the Mitra cult of the Roman army into a whole new religion for the soldier. Adopting his Berte and other attributes of his archetype into the Christ story, these early evangelizing Christians quickly discovered the power of appropriation and incorporation of existing powerful pagan archetypes. Christ could be found everywhere except on images of him being nailed to the cross. Theologians have long pointed to the graves of early Christians with anchors on them, attempting to claim that these are actually crucifixes denoting Christ himself on the cross. The most well known being a grave slab in the catacombs of Domitilla in Rome from around 400 AD. It is clearly not a crucifix, it is an anchor suggesting that the individual interned there was almost certainly a sailor or merchant. During this same period, Christian artwork scratched into walls show Jewish religious scenes such as Noah's Ark and Abraham killing the ram, but none of Christ on the actual cross. The image of Jesus Christ nailed to the cross simply did not exist within Christianity for all of its early ascendancy, and we are talking several, several centuries here. Ironically, the cross shape itself was actually more central to paganism and was used by the Druids of Ireland. This particular specimen being from County Mayo 
from about 2000 years ago, and on to the Hellenic pagan crosses, commonly used in Crete as early as 1600 BC. From the Sol Invictus pagans of Rome to the swastika of the Germanic and Celtic pagan tribes, and on to the Hindus, it would appear that all during the rise of Christianity, everyone except the Christians were using the cross as a spiritual symbol. From the Indus Valley to the west coast of Ireland, pagans were venerating the symbol of the cross, while within Christianity itself, the symbol was either used being a fish or rare depiction of ancient Hebrew events from the first five books of the Torah. Pagan Europe was a landscape awash in the symbol of the cross as a, as a spiritual motif, representing everything from the four seasons to the cardinal points of north, south, east and west, and not one of the myriad of cross shapes and designs being used by the Christians to symbolize the image of Jesus Christ being crucified. To the Christians, the cross was such a universally pagan symbol that they even had strict prohibitions against the cross design, which they were eventually and ironically, and also tellingly, to adopt as a central symbol of their own spiritual veneration. To illustrate this paradox, look no further than the so-called St. Bridge or Bridget Cross of Ireland, which is based upon the sacred swastika of the pagan Celtic peoples, derived from the ancient Indo-European symbol for the fire and the sun. It was to be eventually rotated by the Christians from diagonal to vertical, so to make it look like a Christian crucifix after Ireland had been converted. In his war against heresies in 180 AD, Origen of Alexandria declared the four gospels were indisputable in the Church of God. At the Council of Hippo in 393 AD, it was declared that 27 Jewish books and several Second Temple Rabbinical texts were declared the inspired word of God himself. Four years later, what we now know today as the New Testament was then made official at the Third Council of Carthage in 397 AD. It was at this point that the fundamentals of what we generally call Christianity today came into existence. But alas, still no image of Christ nailed to the cross as the central motif of the Christian church. It was around this time, having spent centuries begging for tolerance and compassion, that once they had the power within the Roman Empire, the Christians reverted to their previous iconoclastic state and commenced a brutal and intolerant war against the pagans of the empire with extreme fanaticism, including atrocity after atrocity. Pagan temples were leveled and rebuilt into churches. Pagan priests were publicly burlesqued and murdered as spectator events until only the Christian faith remained as the official religion of the empire. The paganism of the classical world, which had lasted nearly 3,000 years, had been completely eradicated. While pagan gods and goddesses had either been declared demons or in the case of such female goddesses as Hecate, reinvented into the Virgin Mary, and nuns based on the pagan Vestal Virgins, being now dressed in black, became a kind of birth control used as a means of preventing the daughters of certain powerful, previously pagan families from producing offspring, the nuns becoming the barren brides of Christ instead. This was also the period when the black nobility families, so central to the control of the Catholic Church right up into the present, began to solidify their power within the now theological Roman Empire. These bloodlines were exclusively for the creation of popes to sit upon St. Peter's inverted cross throne while surrounding themselves with an intelligence and espionage system that it would rival the KGB or CIA. Among the earliest efforts of this papal pentagon was to find the ways and methods to get into the minds of the still pagan tribes of Northern and Western Europe.
However, before this could be completed, a fundamental change had to take place within the consciousness of the former pagan peoples of the classical world, and this was the total and complete prohibition of any form of magic or magical practice in accordance with the Torah. Every form of divination, from astrology to auguries, from necromancy to oracles, all so central and sacred to pagan religious life as much as animism, were forbidden as the superstitions of the Gentiles. Once paganism had been completely eliminated within the Roman Empire, the rabbis now calling themselves bishops began the task of transforming the Roman Empire into the all-powerful Holy See of the Vatican. Even so, the church fathers were still forced to adopt classical pagan symbols and feast days in order to compromise the archetypes of the Christian with paganism and also to not disrupt the workings and commercial daily and cultural life of the empire itself. Sunday was removed today as the new Sabbath rather than the Jewish Friday to Saturday sunset to sunset. At this point in history, Christianity was now the only religion within the regions of most of the former Roman Empire. To the Roman mind, the term conquest meant something very different than it looked upon today. To the Romans, the term conquest meant utter annihilation the complete removal of the culture, ruling class, religion, and social structures of the lands they actually conquered. We saw this with the defeat of Carthage. And once the former pagan classical world had been conquered, the Vatican then looked north and west towards the Germanic and Celtic world, setting about a plan for a new conquest. However, in this case, they were to face a very different pagan and social structure than that of the Mediterranean world. One that was also in ascendancy and which had gained power as the traditional military and administrative Roman Empire fell into collapse and division. Unlike the classical world, this part of Europe was not a wounded culture. The Germanic world especially was not a failing empire and therefore would make easy pickings for the Christian religion to co-opt and take over. Northern and Western Europe presented a formidable spiritual and social challenge to the Vatican, and for Christianity to successfully conquer the Germanic and also Celtic world, it was going to have to become somehow Celtic and more especially Germanic itself to a large degree. The black nobility families of Rome and Venice knew precisely what they had to do, even if they had to do it begrudgingly in order to spread the power and influence of the Holy See. And this included rebranding Jesus Christ into something less absurd and pathetic to the Northern and Western European consciousness, who would have seen the image as a coward who failed and didn't live like a warrior. The Celtic and Germanic tribes were only too aware that Christianity was indeed what led to the downfall of the initial Roman Empire as a great power, and the Holy See itself, now controlling that former great power, was in no position to impose their will, and especially their weak saviour upon the pagans of the north and west. When Christian evangelists moved from the Roman world, which by then had been cleansed of its graven images, they entered into a world where graphic imagery was absolutely central to the spiritual life of Germanic peoples. And even more so with the Celtic tribes who celebrated their animistic paganism with intricate and beautifully stylized images of animals and gods. For example, in one case, the Karkal was such a central image to the Goths that at one point St. Augustine adopted a pagan cockerel symbol for himself, and Pope Gregory I even suggested it might well be adopted as the most fitting symbol for Christianity. Here we can see clearly that after 600 years from the alleged death of Jesus Christ, Christians were still looking for a symbol 
to denote and solidify the Christian religion. The image of the fish, bird and even a key were all on the table, but no image of a rabbi named Jesus Christ nailed to a cross in sight. At this point in history, we are only a few centuries away from the sandback crosses at the start of this film. What happened next was so seismic to the story of Christianity that it was to lead to nothing less than the church having to reinvent the story of Jesus Christ on the cross and it was going to have to become so pagan in spiritual dimensions that all this was written out of history only to remain with incomparable archetypes and church secrets. Odin did not bow before Christ. Christ had to bow before Odin and Wotan and then become the apostle all-father of the Christianized heathens in order to avoid being returned to the status of a mere rabbi leading a breakaway Jewish sect in the Middle East. Jesus Christ appropriated the story and spiritual nature of the Nordic god Odin Wotan within the Germanic and Anglo-Saxon world. As the image of Christ on the cross remained one of the many players lobbying for the symbolic representation of Christianity, no more or no less important than that of the cockerel or a pair of keys. So inconsistently stable was the image of the crucifix in within the consciousness of Europeans that even as late as 1432 the image of the lamb was a common symbol of Jesus Christ in Europe. In this famous painting by Hubert and Jan van Eyck we can see that the image of the cross is not even central to the depiction of Christ, who is in fact portrayed as a lamb being sacrificed in a very pagan manner. The sacred image of the sheep or lambs was in fact central to Norse paganism and was also included within Christian imagery as part of this overall hybridization during the centuries of conversion in Northern Europe. Within Judaism itself, the Passover lamb represented a slaying of Egyptian and Semitic pagan gods so as to cleanse the Israelites of idolatry. So in this painting by the two Dutch artists, generally considered to be the world's oldest oil painting, we are being shown the symbolic symbol sacrifice of the pagans of the north and west of Europe, while the crucifix off to the left stands without Jesus nailed upon it. This is the Odenwald, a vast wooded mountain range south of Frankfurt. An area rich in folklore and mythology, its name literally translating as Odin's Wood. Today the location is still a stronghold of paganism and witch lore. This is what remains of the old Germanic world, which the Christians first encountered as they sought to take the stewardship of the Germanic soul. One would assume that the first Christians missionaries to have entered the Odenwald would have been Romans from Southern Europe. In fact, they were mostly Anglo-Saxon and Celtic Christians from today, what we know as Scotland, Ireland and England. These previously converted Celtic missionaries would have been viewed with far less suspicion than ones from Southern Europe and would have also had a greater cultural understanding of the Germanic pagan tribes and their spiritual nature, which, like most paganism, is the animism of nature worship and the belief that the landscape is the domain of gods and goddesses. More importantly, these Celtic missionaries did not trigger memories of ancient Roman legions charging with their swords drawn into the Germanic forests within the ancestral memory of the Teutonic tribes. Nevertheless, even using Christian, Celtic and Anglo-Saxon missionaries, how were they going to place a Jewish rabbi from the desert in a landscape such as this? The deep, vast and foreboding and mythologically saturated woodlands of the Germanic world and beyond. The simple fact was they were not going to be able to do this. 
they would have to not only describe correlations between Wotan, Odin and Jesus, but literally dress Jesus Christ up in the Odin or Wotan mythology within the consciousness of those willing to listen. Then after a while, grow this new Germanic Christ or Christ mythology until the older generations forgot about Wotan and Odin, but his archetype remained in the story of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Also in Germany is the natural rock formation of the Exensteiner. The location was a sacred place for both the Anglo-Saxons and later a place of pilgrimage for Christians of the Middle Ages. Among the carvings on the rock is an almost Dadaist representation of the crucifixion. Below this is the image of the Immersol, a sacred tree of Germanic pagans, which the real Immersol tree was later destroyed by Charlemagne during the Carolingian Wars to finally end paganism among the Saxons. The image of Christ next to the broken Immersol is very, very cryptic, but also very, very psychologically powerful. The broken Immersol is the Yggdrasil world tree on which Odin or Wotan hanged himself in order to attain spiritual enlightenment and to gain the secrets of the rune. Within this frieze it's shown broken and also there is Wotan or Odin being alchemically dissolved into the Christ story in order to saturate the Germanic pagan consciousness with a more agreeable archetype. Christ becomes Odin or Wotan. Odin and Wotan become Christ. The two images juxtaposed. The old fate and the new fate. With the same archetype. If not slightly altered. All that was then needed is a few centuries controlled by forgotten and suppressed spiritual memories and Wotan Odin on the Immersil or Yggdrasil world tree is eventually replaced with Jesus Christ on the cross in the conscience of all. The ultimate theological bait and switch. However, as the Christians would have wished, the story did not end there. The Anglo-Saxon and Germanic bishops were given secret codes within their ecclesiastical objects as a reminder of where their god originally came from. Now, this was done because the early church understood the enduring power of the pagan archetypes and sacred locations. From holy wells to the columns and roofs of the great Gothic cathedrals designed to mimic the old great forests of Europe and the darkness within their canopies where paganism flourished. Christianity north of the Alps became the primary formula for the symbols and veneration of the fate throughout the Holy See, not just in the north but also in the entire Catholic Church itself. Wotan and Odin remained the All Father in an archetypal sense, otherwise the religion of Christianity would have never gained a foothold in the Germanic and Anglo-Saxon consciousness. North of the Alps was a very different place than south of the Alps and required a whole new form of co-opted, subterfuged and archetypally kidnapped spiritual compromise. We finished this story in the small Scottish village of Rutwell. Within Rutwell there is a remarkable artefact known uninspiringly as the Rutwell Cross. Originating from the 8th century when Ruthwell was still part of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Northumbria and the Ruthwell Cross is considered one of the greatest and the most important treasures from the period when Christianity was starting to make inroads into Britain. On the cross it contains a poem considered to be the oldest surviving work in English literature and from a genre known as dream poetry. The title of the poem is known as the Dream of the Rood and is a fusion of pagan and Christian elements. The Dream of the Rood contains deliberate cryptic stanzas of riddles and repetitive ambiguity. The fact that the poem is part of such a monumental object suggests that its cryptic nature was its most important aspect, only to be known by a select few. This may have been a riddle in verse, 
but it was strategically important from a spiritual point of view to the individuals who understood its codified hidden meanings and occultic conventions. The Dream of the Ruid describes a tree which is both conscious and also has a spiritual nature on par with that of Jesus Christ. The symbol of the world tree of the pagans is firmly connected to that of the passion of the Christ within the dream of the Ruud, as if they were one and the same, because they are one and the same. The cross-pollination of symbolic meanings on the Rutwell cross is obvious, that it is Christ himself that has been crucified upon the pagan tree of life, and that Christ and Odin are the same deity, at least from an archetypal conveyance point of view. Although today this correlation is passed off as a simple metaphor, in order to evangelize the pagans of the Anglo-Saxon world, in much the same manner in which St. Patrick's Shamrock is a direct association between the triple goddess paganism of the Irish Gaels and that of the Christian Trinity. What is being demonstrated in fact on the Rutwell Cross is blatantly announcing that Jesus Christ, the Germanic god Wotan, or Odin as he is more commonly known, are the same entity. In the Dream of the Rood, Christ is presented as a classical Germanic heroic warrior in a purposeful and brave sacrifice upon the cross. Christ is shown as a heroic lord, sacrificing himself as would a great warrior would choose to do so rather than to suffer a humiliating trial, persecution and death at the hands of his enemies. This sacrifice was an honourable death in battle, a concept so integral to Germanic and Celtic peoples rather than the trial, judgment and persecution found within the compassion of Christ, which would have been viewed by the pagan Anglo-Saxons as being weak, pathetic and also pointless. In other words, what the Dream of the Rood tells us is that Christianity would not have been able to spread to Northern and Western Europe had it not been that the life of Christ was reconfigured into the pagan god and heroic spiritual lord of Wotan Odin. The answer to the question who stole the Allfather is obvious when one looks at the inverted cross on which the Pope to this day sits. This is not Saint Peter, this is Odin suspended upon the world tree at the centre of the Holy See.